In this episode, we take a look at the Hiawatha Elevated District, General Mills. We do our research, as well as swing over the table saw and start ripping up some PVC. We take a look at the switch machines in action, as well as the switch stands. And of course, join Bob Rivard to go. We also check out what the curmudgeon's gripe of the week is this week. Only in this episode of Sooth the Milwaukee Road. Today we're going to take a look at the General Mills elevator to give a breakdown as to the size of the elevator as well as what we're looking at and what we're trying to achieve in the modeling world. If you're uh, not familiar with where we're modeling, yeah, Minneapolis in the upper left-hand corner, I'm looking at the Hiawatha Elevator District that is running kind of from northwest to the southeast. So we'll zoom in here and take a look at General Mills and this elevator here itself. We're in Google Maps, so we have the opportunity to kind of give it a three-dimensional look to see what we're, uh, we're going to be trying to achieve here. And one of the things I'm going to address first things first is just the size of the actual silos. As you can see, we're going from large to medium to small. These are actually fairly close to the Walters silos. They're a little bit taller, but um, it's not something I'm going to split hairs over. I am just going to cut these up into PVC. The elevator for a Walters elevator, and the elevator actually head house, or this tower here, um, would fall kind of right in this area here. So that gives you an idea of the scale and the size of these particular elevators or the head houses. And what we're going to actually be achieving here today is the silos themselves. So we're going to go large, medium, and small. And what I'm doing for sizes is this size, I'm going to be using a three inch. I'm going to use a two and a half inch here. And then these are going to be two inch uh, in diameter. And what we've got as far as the number of them, I got 10 in the two inch. I've got five in the two and a half inch, and I've got five in the three inch. But I might scale that down just slightly, and by that I mean I think I'm going to do four of these, four of these, and maybe eight of these just from uh, selective compression to be able to get this entire elevator in. We're going to mock it up and take a look at it in the actual room to get an idea for the size. All right, it's time to test out the knowledge on the red and white. This is 2114. It can be seen here in a winterized state with the buckets over the stacks. Another notable element to this unit, and it's got a single bulb on the dual headlight. It's hard to see, but that is not a painted over bulb. Rather, it's a blank cast aluminum with an EMD embossed logo. Do you know which railroad this SW9 was built for? Was it A, m &S, B, Milwaukee, C, Sioux, or D, WC? We'll find out later in this episode. All right, here we are looking at the General Mills elevator uh, on the Hiawatha Elevator District, mocking it up, getting it close to where I want it to be. Now, prototypically, I said these are the three inch, these are the two and a half inch, and these are gonna need to use um, two inch PVC to be able to create the look. I said the Walters ones were a little short because on the scale ruler, they're about 64 feet in height. I need to get up to 74 feet. So what I've done is actually created a set of PVC that I've ripped up. And we'll replace these. There's eight of them here. The prototype had 10 with a little extra uh, PVC. Just to give you an idea, this would be one, two. So that's where 10 would be. It's too long because my road is technically crossing right here. Here's where that crossover is. I don't want to get the road into those switches. So what I'm needing to do is put the elevator on a little bit of a diet. One way to do it is I could drop off one of the three inch silos that helps slide it over. I could drop one of the two and a half inch silos that help slide it over. And I probably could drop one of the two inch. So the whole thing would compress just slightly enough to be able to still give myself the look, the scale and everything I'm looking for on the prototype side of things, but be able to allow myself not to be to botch up the crossing, the road crossing over here. So what we're gonna do here is actually now take a look at the head house. The head house from a prototype standpoint, should actually be close to minus the top portion here, something in this height. And you're looking at it going, oh, that's huge. That's because we've spent so much time looking at these Walther's head houses on all the model railroads we've ever seen. Um, this is more prototypically accurate. You look at the size and the scale compared to the cars. Now you're actually talking about something that's prototypically to scale. I said, I want to get to one to one. This is as close as I can get to one to one with a little bit of that selective compression, still having the feel of the elevators of the Hiawatha Elevator District. We'll take a look at uh, how I end up ripping these through. I've talked about it in the past, how I ran it through the table saw to flatten two sides, but uh, we'll slow it down just a little bit so you can take a look at the actual procedure and process.
All right, today we're gonna to take a look at a couple of my favorite things. One of them is the Milwaukee Road Chevron uh, that is available through Small Scale Innovative. They have a nice Chevron that you can apply to the Lions West switch stands if you choose to do so. Lions West does provide a Chevron. You're looking at the version they provided, which is a piece of paper that um, the registration was off in the back. So I end up having to color it in with a red marker. They have improved it, I believe. So Lions West does always continue to improve their products. This is the product that you were looking at for the switch stand. It is uh, a six pack that I have selected. Uh, he has a number of different versions available. Uh, you can go to lionswestproducts.com. Here are the actual resin printed uh, switch stands. As you can see there, I'm gonna zoom in just to let you see the detail. You can see the wagon wheel on top as well as there actually is, I'm gonna get in better position. You can see the arm to be able to throw the switch stand. I mean, that detail is just that impressive. There is a small hole in the top of the wagon wheel where you're able to then drill through and drill all the way down. And I drilled all the way through the resin to be able to then mount um, the chevron that you can see here. So I drilled through and end up being able to create an actual working switch stand and the wire that I used was KNS number 0 0.015. Um, it's a four piece wire. It's the same wire that I use on my m &S culvert loads. So we're gonna take a look at how this thing uh, actually functions, but I uh, gotta appreciate the products that are being put out by these small manufacturers like Small Scale Innovative, as well as Lions West. Thanks a lot guys for bringing us some Milwaukee Road stuff. Now let's take a look at how it functions and works. All right, here we are looking at the linkages to the servo. The one that is driving here, this is what throws the switch. So the one right here is what's throwing the switch. And then this linkage that goes up, it goes to a little 90 degree bend. That is what is throwing the switch stand. So the Chevron is being thrown by this one linkage here, simply done like so. And there you have it. That's how the two of them are thrown. Switch thrown at the same time as the switch stand. We're about to chop up some PVC, but first, chopping wood. I'm gonna make a couple end stops. for the PVC to create silos. All right, now that we've cut our two pieces of wood, I'm gonna demonstrate how I flat side these um, pieces of PVC. In this particular case, I flat sided both sides. I have another one here. I've only flat sided one side because this is the end of the silo. Now what I'm gonna do in this particular procedure is use a piece of extra PVC I've left over. Those sections I had just shown you are 74 feet in scale height. This is a lot higher than that. But if I need one at 90, if I need one at 84, I don't wanna mess up uh, and shorten this just for demonstration purposes. So we're just gonna run through this full length extra piece of a PVC. Uh, one thing I do want you to note is the writing that's on the side. Have that be one of your flat spots because then you can eliminate it and you don't have to deal with it if you're painting it or anything of that nature trying to cover it up. So what I'm gonna do here is take the two pieces of wood that we just recently cut. I'm putting one on each end of the piece of PVC. I'm gonna use a bar clamp to be able to set up and clamp the boards onto the ends of the PVC. I end up using the fence to make sure that I'm square against it, as well as making sure that my clamp is, you know, lined up square and centered on the piece of PVC. Okay, now that I have it clamped up, I'm gonna be able to raise the blade. On the end of the PVC, you can see how much I want to take off. And that's what I've just set inside on the fence to make sure that's the amount I'm gonna take off. Cause I don't wanna get so thin that it actually goes through the wall. I am gonna glue these things together. So keep that in mind when you are ripping it through the table saw. Now that I've ripped it through one time, I end up taking it out of the clamp. I rotate it 180 degrees. So it's, in this case, clear your table saw off. And you want this flat on your table saw because you're gonna run this through again. I end up using the fence as my guide. And by guide, I mean I want it flat, I want it square, so I end up running another even pass on this other side of the pipe. 
as we mentioned before, the amount that we're taking off, I end up uh, flipping it over and I'm going to take this right to there. So you want to roughly take off the same amount on both sides as close as you can. So then when you do butt them against each other, you got just a nice even joint. And there we have it. That's how we flat side the sides of the PVCs. And well, if you want to make a flat, which is just going to be cutting one of these in half. So it has a more shallow depth against the background. As you can see, I've clamped it up in such a way that flat spots go into the bottom. The blades can actually come up and cut through the center. I've got it clamped up uh, so I don't have to be anywhere near the saw blade. And in the process like this, you don't want to be losing any fingers. So we'll fire it up and uh, run these babies through. And there we have it. We have a couple pieces of PVC that's ready for a flat. All right, it's time to submit your guess for which railroad was this SW9 built for. If you guessed D, the Wisconsin Central, you'd be correct. It was built on 1252. Well, after Columbus sailed the ocean blue, it was delivered as WC2114. All right, just to summarize what we've got going on here, we did all the hacking, yakking, and whacking to create the PVC silos. Uh, they end up turning out quite nice. I was happy with the results. What we've got here are what was 10 prototypical length uh, in terms of the silos themselves. I brought it to nine. I ended up dropping down from five here. I went to four. I went from five here to four. That was the equivalent of roughly 54 feet or the length of a freight car. That's really something I was willing to sacrifice because if I had built it, the, the actual elevator would be down here. The location of this road would have shifted right through the middle of these turnouts. And aesthetically, that selective compression, it's okay to be able to pull in just a little bit because you know what? It's an illusionary art. If you look at the area and you look at this elevator and you're like, I know where that is. You've done your job. You've created the illusion that you want uh, when the guys switch in this particular area. Plus, the overall scale, it's cool to actually see the size of these cars. They look small compared to the size of the elevators. So doing those type of things, adjusting and creating something unique like this is one way to be able to make your railroad look that much more unique and that much more prototypical. But before diving into more of this prototypical and getting this thing all finished, I'm gonna focus on making sure that the track work works, the operations work, because first and foremost, bulletproof track goes a long way. Something that looks beautiful and scenic and done, if it doesn't operate well, that's no fun. And fun is what it's all about, right? So that's what we've got going on. We're gonna keep moving forward on getting this thing operating. But before I get to there, I got some cleaning up to do. Rail fanning with Rivard to go. In the Hiawatha Elevator District. Well, rain has started to pick up, and Bob has actually worked his way north towards 32nd Street to check out some more action. Well, these guys slowly shove these cars north. We're going to just kind of look at some of the freight cars that are involved here. One of the unique ones happens to be these gray boring cars. Actually, not boring. These are the DR series, which is the, uh, it's either Dardanelle in Russellville or Dardanelle. One of the two. Either way. Boring car, I'd like to see a logo or something. At least BN puts a big, huge BN on it. And speaking of character, the Chicago Northwestern, there's a couple of cars here. One of them actually has a placard. And note that the lube plate is also a placard. It's kind of a cool detail if you're modeling one of these type of cars. Another cool detail, and sad for some, is the lack of Herald on number 467. It's on the other side, just not here. As these guys wave goodbye, we wave goodbye as well, but we will join Bob one last time in the season finale of Sue the Milwaukee Road. Alright, here's the curmudgeon coming at you for the gravity. This week it's reading, and I'm not talking about magazines or books about trains, I'm talking about way bills and anything that's involved in an operating session if I've got to be coming over to your place to do a book report. <laughs> the old Crumudge is not interested in reading the Crumudge who wants to run a train, so I just need to know where's the car going, I don't care where it's from, I don't care what's in it, I just want to know where it's supposed to go. And that's the Crumudge that's going to arrive at a week. <laughs> the old Crumudge is not interested in reading the Crumudge who wants to run a train. A 
A big thanks to everybody that watches to the end that has hit like, hit subscribe, as well as made comments in the past. It's those actions that help share this content, so if you haven't checked out other episodes, feel free to do so. You can also check out the tour of the GN in 1970, as well as the past episodes of the GN in 1970. 70s. <laughs> the old curmudgeon's not interested in reading the curmudgeon wants to run a train. Ah, no.